Hi, kiddies. This is Jeff Clement from Oral Stimulation. I'm sorry to say that creepy reading couldn't be here. He's indisposed. On tonight's menu, we have three tales. We'll begin with concentration, followed by a little tale known as 091710, finally ending with Out in the Woods. Will the stories be any good? Only time will tell. So sit back, relax, turn the lights down, and let's begin. Dear Mom, everyone says that this godforsaken war is ending sometime soon, and to be frank, I don't think so, or rather, I, I just don't know. We dropped into the Netherlands just yesterday, uh, but those last 24 hours seem like an entire century. I write this letter to you in the hopes that I can get this out to someone, anyone who's willing to listen. You see, the, um, the Germans. Um, have these things called concentration camps. We don't know the exact reasons yet, but they haul these Jews, God rest their souls, and um, yeah, they send them to these camps. And I don't know. They kill them, I guess. We found one of those yesterday, and I remember it all so clearly. Jeremy and I were the first ones out of a plane. We dropped right above a cloud bank so we couldn't see the ground, and couldn't see the ground until it was quite too late to maneuver around. Jeremy was the first to see the sprawling square of gray buildings and gray everything. These people on the ground were walking in their gray uniforms and they were in a bunch of gray watchtowers. So, so I, I guess that's why Jeremy started screaming bloody murder, telling me that we're gonna get killed by the Germans and all this other propaganda bullshit I didn't need to deal with at the time. I, I looked down and the first thing that hit me was how slow these guys in the gray uniforms were walking around. They were, they were more like shambling around. Actually, I, I, I don't think I realized that till quite now, actually. But, as I began to realize, almost all of them were standing still. They had already spotted us, but they were moving slowly into what seemed to be a circle at the time. And at this point, Jeremy was screaming so loudly that my ears were ringing and I couldn't really focus on anything. And to be honest, for a small moment there, I thought his head was going to explode. I tried to calm him down, but to be honest, most of my attention was focused on the ground below us. At this point, I could see their uniforms quite clearly, and I knew that the people down there weren't soldiers. Not at all. They were, um, too thin. They wore striped shirts and pants, and, well, from upon first guess, I, I would assume that they were prisoners. It was only a matter of seconds before we hit the ground, and Jeremy was trying to hug me. He was asking me to deliver something to his ma and tell his gal that he loved her and all that kind of stuff. I just kept on telling him everything's gonna be okay, you know, D don't panic, and that these people are just prisoners of war, and... All that, but I was distracted by the people in the gray suits down there. They were almost in a perfect circle just standing, and what really got to me though is how they were looking at us at first glance. I thought they were looking at us as if we were food. But it was the glint in their eyes, that special frown they had. It was pity. Jeremy started crying the minute we hit the ground. I removed my gear and had to get his off too. It hit me, though. It hit me then, when no one else dropped from our plane. No use of... No use of getting a heavy paratrooper gear off of Jeremy. I, he, he just kept it sobbing on the ground, saying that the Crocs got us, and he didn't sign up for this, and this and that. 
Fuck. It was just me and a prisoners. I looked at them and they looked back at me. None of them had any weapons, so I had assumed that they weren't in the middle of an insurrection or anything. There weren't many Nazi corpses lying around either. But there was something that I can recall very clearly. It was the smell of rot. It was the smell of something dead. The smell of that... I, I've been in the war for quite a while now, and I know the smell of rotting flesh when I smell it. I, I didn't know what to do, so from that point on, I, I tried to communicate, saying, Hello? Anyone there? Something along those lines, and there was no response, only just expressionless faces. They gave me the creep, so I withdrew my pistol from its holster. What's going on? At that point, Jeremy got on, got up, and he finally accepted the fact that we are surrounded by prisoners of war, but I motioned for him to stop and take a sudden, just, just a look, and I said, uh, I again tried to explain to him what was going on. I was saying, Jeremy, come on! Just prisoners of war, man. We're, we're fine, fine. I, even though in my heart, I, I quite frankly knew that that it wasn't fine. There was something clearly off. Suddenly, I, I heard a ripping sound, and I turned around, and I saw one of the prisoners' arms quite literally had fallen off. What? Jeremy had barely a second to react before one of, the, before there were more of those noises coming from around all of us. I swore just a minute ago I saw human faces, human bodies looking at me, and now I was staring into the face of death. There wasn't really under any other way to explain it. The wind started picking up from the sky above. It darkened considerably. And all the while, the question of why the fuck this was happening to prisoners ran through my head. The answer was obvious. We were surrounded by quite literally standing corpses. And now I, I saw that their eyeballs were withered and dirty. The facial features had that fell off one by one, cheeks had holes in them, and foreheads had bullet wounds, and the only consistent thing about them were their clothes, that shade of grey, I tell you, if I ever see that fucking shade again, I'm gonna vomit! Jeremy had already begun running around, but we were still surrounded, and even though they are prisoners' bodies, they were falling apart. It seemed that they were slowly closing in on us. Even though I couldn't quite see any definite movement in their feet, I could feel the area around me closing in. I could see the effects of times. Legs became femurs and faces turned into skulls. And in a few seconds, piles of bone and rotting flesh laid around us. Yet there was still one prisoner who remained. Even though... All of his brethren had died. He stood there ever so slightly shaking back and forth. His head was fixated on the ground, but I swear it snapped up in a quarter of a second when I aimed my pistol at him. Don't move! I, I yelled. Jeremy was probably running for his life right now, but I wasn't about to leave this guy on our tail. He had to be dealt with. He stared at me as eyelids pulled back all the way. I fired a warning shot at his feet and he merely smiled and laughed. It was ear-piercing laugh. That I, I can't even describe it. He was pulling right at it. He crocked his head up and laughed and I turned around and I began running towards Jeremy. At this point I realized that there was something more that we were dealing with. Something that a mere pistol couldn't deal with. As I continued on, the laughs got worse and more odd sounding, more animalistic than anything. <laughs> and now I, I think we're s I, I think I know why it sounded so packed. His lair and it, his lyrics was deteriorating as he was doing it. There were the popping noises behind me of his limbs falling off and I don't God I have a headache right now to be frank. I am I'm doing I'm trying my best to call my situation. I don't really remember what happened after that. Jeremy and I met up in HQ about an hour apart, and even though neither of us had a map, we made our way through the forest that took a, that took a normal jeep four hours, and we got through it in 30 minutes. We found our squad leader, and he told us that we were missing during roll call that morning. We told him our story, and he told us about the concentration camps, and of course, he didn't believe us, especially about 
certain parts of our story, I mean, who, who, quite frankly, who would? How could a man rot in a matter of seconds, he stated. Perhaps there's more to this mystery. How did we end up in a place that could only be reached by para-dropping para out of a plane when we weren't even in a plane? I have no idea what the fuck's going on right now. I could have sworn I was in a plane, but apparently we are already at camp and people actually saw us around the camp. I don't know. Nobody agreed to talk about the forest. To, well, no one agreed to not talk, but trek through the forest and try to find this concentration camp that everyone, that, that well, me and my friend Jeremy found. And when we were asked to go back there, of course, in the end, Jeremy decided against it. <sighs> oh yes, um, I know I may sound like I was wrapping this up earlier, but there's one more thing. Today, we captured a village. Uh, I tell you what it's called, but I don't remember the name. Something, I don't know, foreign sounding, I guess. We were lucky. We got, uh, we got enough, um... Enough of a surprise to capture all the German soldiers without a fight. We even caught a high-ranking German officer. Our, our, our corpse man, Nate, took some German language classes while he was in the university. Our squad leader told him to interrogate this officer and about, about the key defensive positions. The number of soldiers in this area, that type of thing, and then I realized this could be our chance to find out something. I told Nate to ask the officer about concentration camps in the area. Nate um, took some time to describe the camps to the officer, and since I doubt that German classes can teach you how to say concentration camp in German, I don't think we were able to get much out, but anyway, that's not the point. The officer shook his head saying that they cleared out of all the concentration camps about a month ago and they retreated to Germany. Meaning that that camp we went to? According to the, um, Nazis, never existed. A couple of months ago, I begun my classes at Chicago State University. As I was preparing for my freshman year, I was able to find everything that I needed, except for a laptop. I'm not exactly very good at letting a dollar go for something, especially when I know I can get it for, well, something less. <sighs> so I scoured the internet for good deals on laptops, and finding none that suited my frugal habits, classes were only two weeks away. And I was becoming desperate for a computer. In fact, I was getting ready to settle and go right on to Best Buy, but several days later, I saw an ad in the newspaper for a laptop being sold for only $600. Not too far from my live, either. It was a very nice Dell laptop, too. Seeming odd that it was only being sold for a thousand... Well, seemed odd that it was being sold for almost less than a thousand dollars in store price. There might be something wrong with it, or... I don't know. I kept my mind open, but I kept the understanding that there could be something severely wrong with it. I drove to the seller's address the following day. The house was farther out of the city, butting up to a dense forest. Outside the house, there was an old Chevrolet and a mess of old signs and various other vintage looking items. I rang the doorbell and a thin man in a flannel jacket came to the door. When I asked about the laptop, he looked almost relieved and told me that he was ready to sell it immediately. Luckily, I came with cash in hand and after proof of good condition, I went home with my new computer. I was excited to have my first self-bought laptop and I powered it up and I began uploading my own programs and applications onto it. Upon searching the hard drive, I found a holder fitting away on, hidden away on it. It was odd because the man selling it to me told me that the memory was wiped clean and ready for a fresh start. The folder was titled 09 
1710. Presumably a date, of course. I opened a folder revealing six videos and three pictures. Curiosity got the best of me and I decided to watch the videos. The first video was simply titled 001. The video was shot from a shaky camcorder inside of a vehicle, a recording of a woman walking out of a bar and getting into a car at night. After a couple of seconds, the woman drove off and almost immediately the person recording the video began to drive after her. The video ended after 24 seconds and... It almost seemed like the cameraman had been waiting for this gal for a while. Come to think of it, I wasn't too alarmed of this by, well, at the time. Just a little unsettled. I opened the next video, which was titled 002. Simple, easy, and down to the point. I assumed that this was going to be the next part of the first video, and my assumption was right, as it began with the camera on top of the console facing the windshield. It was raining now, leading me to believe that this was only a short while after the first video ended. I could barely make out that the vehicle was two cars ahead of this one, but it indeed was the same car that the woman left in. This went on for an unsettling 47 seconds before the camera cuts out. I began to get a little nervous, fearing that this might take a turn for the worst. But as if I was watching a television show, I wanted to see where this was heading. Not totally concerned yet, I decided to press on. The third video, of course, was titled 003. This is the one that got me officially concerned and not intrigued. The clip begun from the same shaky hands as the first clip. It was now pouring rain outside of the car, and I could barely make out a figure in a fur coat and an umbrella walking into the front door of the house. I could only assume who this person was and whose hands it belonged to. The figure entered the house and closed the door. The following stillness greatly unnerved me. The only thing that could be heard was the sound of rain dumping on top of the car and after roughly two minutes of nerve-wracking nothingness. The lights inside the house cut out. Another moment or so went by before the camera was placed onto the console again and then the sound of a person exiting the car broke the stillness. After the car door quietly closed, another figure, this time hooded, could be seen walking towards the house. I began feeling a tight knot to the bottom of my stomach as a stranger walked around the back of the house or whoever this fucking person was. He definitely wasn't supposed to be there. After another couple of seconds, the light outside the house cut off. It was quite pitch black, and only the rain alerted me that the camera was still rolling. The video ended after about nine minutes of rain and darkness. I was pretty sure that this wasn't some sort of innocent project or anything of that nature at this point, and I had begun to feel stupid for not checking the laptop uh, seller's credibility. Was this person stalking this woman, the same person that I met earlier? Throughout the whole experience, I had this dormant feeling in the back of my head that I, I probably should just call the police and let that be that, but I wasn't ready just yet. Reluctantly, now I begun the fourth video, 004. Again, simple, and quite frankly, I like it that way. It was dark again, but the rain had stopped, and I was left with only silence. Not long after the clip begun, I could make out the sound of footsteps on gravel getting louder and louder as someone was approaching the vehicle. The car door opened, and a dome light was turned on and I could tell that the camera was now on the floor of the car, pointing up towards the roof. I heard some fumbling around in the background, and then suddenly a thump that came from the back of the truck. An arm abruptly obstructed the camera's view of the large, um, tarp that could be seen being pulled out from the car, and I had only one scenario running through my head, and I hoped that, hoped to God that that wasn't true. The person picked up the camera, put it back on the console, and begun to back up. They drove for a solid three minutes before, well, parking in a branched off road and exiting the car to work on the load that they were carrying. Six minutes after the car was moved again to the different location and the camera was picked up, 
and then underhand carried away from the car. I could see now that it was the same shit bucket truck I saw in front of the um, seller's house. I was about ready to call the cops on this fucking creep when the camera turns towards the house. It was completely different. It was a completely different house than the one I visited. I was a little relieved by this, though it didn't prove anything. As the fourth video came to an end, I was wondering whether or not I was prepared to see what was going to come next. I, I, I could only hope that this was some sort of prank. Haha, <laughs> fuck you, you bought my computer. Or, or at least some sort of happy ending, but... 005 begun inside a house, and it was extremely dark, and the only thing I could make out was a figure that occasionally walked in front of the camera. It was also quiet for the first few moments and min minutes of the you know, occasional barking dog outside. Uh, eventually, a small sound started to appear. The small sound soon escalated to a loud, muffled scream. Shaking and struggling sounds became more apparent as time went on as well as crying. A light abruptly came on the camera and it was lifted and panned to the center of the room, revealing... A beaten, bloodied woman tied to a chair. From what I could make out, this was, in fact, the same woman from the bar. The camera zoomed in on her face for what seemed like an eternity before stopping. I, I couldn't believe what in the fuck I was watching or happening. The, the original hope was that this was a movie or something along those lines that had been long since diminished. But with only the video remaining, I... I was beginning to fear for my own safety. I locked my door, closed my blinds, and pushed onward. I begun 006 with the small hope that this woman was still alive, and that I could possibly have her saved. The final installment of this godforsaken horror show begun in the bathroom setting. The camera was placed on the counter facing a mirror, in which I could see a door. The only sound I could make out was a familiar sound that destroyed my hopes power tools. I sat in front of the screen for what felt like hours before the sound stopped. More silence, then heavy footsteps, accompanied by what sounded like something being dragged. The doorknob turned and... The doorknob turned and the door was pushed open. Out of the darkness of the rest of the house appeared a middle-aged woman dressed in what I only could describe as lab attire sporting a respirator and a pair of rubber gloves. This, for some, well, strange reason, gave me a small amount of relief and, well, in reflection, the, in reflection, the woman struggled to drag something into the bathtub. As she was hoisted into the tub, I could see that, that it was a large black garbage bag. I felt like I was dreaming. It was like watching a horror movie unfolding on screen. Except, it was a little odd, like one of those shaky cam movies, but if it was a bit more realistic, heavy on atmosphere. She lifted a bag from the tub and it was now empty except for whatever entrails that still dropped out. She picked up the camera and placed it on the ground facing the tub. On the floor, in the front of the bathtub, was an assortment of corrosive substances and several other empty containers. The woman began to dump the liquids into the tub, which was followed by an awful, awful noise that I only could describe as pop rocks being mixed with coke. The video ended, and I was left to be whittled and panicked, and I finally opened the pictures. Then the first picture was of a trunk. The second picture is one of the girls tied up before she was beaten, and the third picture was brought up as a corrupted file. Maybe that was a good thing. Maybe that this was something that was better left unseen. I managed to get to two pictures before I handed the laptop over to the police. I was re- well, reimbursed my $600 along with a bonus. Apparently the victim was of a young girlfriend of another older woman's ex-husband. Um, the older woman was arrested almost a year ago, but was freed of all charges due to lack of evidence, and the um, ex-husband was incarcerated instead. I guess this was the missing link. I hope this solved any unanswered questions, although I'm not quite sure who the man in the flannel jacket was, or how he got a hold of the laptop. Or how he owns the same truck as the murderer. 
I guess I'll leave that to the police. This this isn't something that I should be investigating in. Thanks for listening, and I hope you found my story interesting, I guess. Signing off. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is your good old friend, Mr. Widemouth. And today, that creepy reading, as previously mentioned, is indisposed of. So, why don't we wrap this little tale up? The first story, Concentration, was a lovely little tale. It did everything right, although the build-up could be obviously better. But, in the end, what else could we ask for a short story about the World War II pleasures? <laughs> oh nine seventeen ten was a classic creepypasta in my personal opinion. However, in the end, it felt like there was something more to be desired. I'd recommend a 7 out of 10. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for Saturday when we got a lovely little open mic night for all you kitties and ghouls to enjoy. Till then, be scared.